Hello and welcome to In Control, the first podcast on control theory. Here we discuss the science of feedback, decision making, artificial intelligence, and much more. I'm your host, Alberto Padoan, live from our recording studio at ETH Zurich. Quick thanks to our sponsor, the National Center of Competence in Research on Dependable Ubiquitous Automation, which you can check following the link in the description. Our guest today is Florian Dorfler, with whom I have the privilege and pleasure to interact on a daily basis. Florian is an associate professor at the Automatic Control Laboratory at ETH Zurich, and the deputy head of the Department of Information Technology and Electrical Engineering. Welcome to the show, Florian. Alberto, my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. So, Florian, uh, at a relatively young age, you've achieved a lot already, uh, at least academically speaking. So how did it all start? Well, just like many in our field, I was really attracted by the unique combination of mathematical beauty, but also practically relevant problems that we can solve. And so when I was in high school, I always wanted to do math afterwards, but useful math. I didn't know what that was. At some point, I got a flyer in my hand that said cybernetics, come to Stuttgart and study that. To be honest, I had no idea what it was, but it sounded cool. And so that, that's how I got hooked in the field. So it was quite a random entry. Quite a random entry, but you really got attracted. Definitely. And I should give full credit to that to all my mentors over the years my role models, my heroes that just guided me along the way and kept the passion burning from uh, Stuttgart, Toronto, Santa Barbara, all the way to now. Yeah, right, because you started your career in Germany, but then you moved to Canada to work with uh, Bruce yeah. Francis, right? Yes, correct. I was one of the last students of the late Bruce Francis, and it was really a privilege. I, I truly cherished the memories I had with him, the, you know, all afternoon long blackboard sessions working out equations on the board. He taught me so much, not about science only, but life in general. And he is really my all time hero. Yeah, Bruce Francis was definitely one of the giants of our field, but somehow you didn't like the flatness of Ontario, yes, right? <laughs> yes. I mean, I grew up in the Alps. And so my freedom activities were centered around, you know, rock climbing, skiing, mountain biking, you name it. Yeah. Ontario just had a flat topography. You could go ice skating. But that was about <laughs> it. So, so I had a geographic constraint for where to go next. And California got me hooked, for sure. Yeah, California was quite attractive. And I guess also it was easy to connect the research that you had done in Canada with uh, the research of your PhD advisor, Francesco Bullo. Is... Yes, that is so. So in Canada, I worked on formation control. So how do you stabilize a set of robots to a prescribed geometric configuration using only relative sensing information? And at multiple points... Uh, Bruce Francis mentioned to me, you know, there's this brilliant guy in Santa Barbara, Francesco Bullo. Every time I read his paper, I feel like he stole the problem, you know, and I wish I had had the problem. And then I really got hooked on that guy. I said, I want to work with Francesco Bullo. <laughs> and, you know, the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, Plato used to say that the beginning is the most important part of the work, and you certainly did well at the beginning. You made a splash with a paper on uh, synchronization, but I know there's a funny anecdote uh, behind that paper. Yes. Um, so when we wrote the paper on, uh, I think it's called Synchronization in Complex Oscillator Networks and Smart Power Grids, I was uh, a summer intern at the Los Alamos National Laboratories in New Mexico. By the way, there's really great, great rock climbing there. <laughs> so when I, when I, you know, I worked on this problem all summer long for three, four months on essentially how can I provide a parametric stability condition when a whole bunch of coupled nonlinear oscillators would synchronize can provide a condition depending on model parameters and the graph topology. And I found the solution. Um, it worked it wonderfully. I checked the numerics. It, it, you know, it, it, it checked out really well. And I knew it was a long-standing problem. And decades of people have been working on that in mathematical biology, for instance. Two days before my summer internship came to an end, I found a mistake in my proof. And I was really desperate and demotivated. And I knew I had a 17 drive. 17 hour drive back to Santa Barbara. So what I did, I spent two days immersing myself into all the equations. So I had them all burned into my mind because I knew during those 17 hours, there's nothing else to do other than think. So having had all the equations in my mind, 
Actually, during that 17-hour ride, I found an alternative proof strategy, which eventually worked out. Um, but then uh, you shifted towards power systems dynamics. I guess that's quite connected to the idea of network control. Then you moved to studying social networks and more recently data-driven control. So can you give us a sense of your research trajectory? Yes, of course. So when I was working on synchronization of power systems, I got sucked more and more into the application and I studied lots of uh, circuit theory, electrical networks, uh, power systems, electrodynamics, power electronics, and I just found a whole bunch of really exciting control problems there, which people have not tackled yet, uh, at least not yet at the standards that we're used to in control theory. And that just you know, rapidly expanded my portfolio of problems as well as methods that needed to, to solve them. Yeah, so speaking of which, we should all acknowledge that um, machine learning has profoundly influenced the research in control over the past few years. Yes, it did. So sure. some would argue that the power of machine learning is yet to be demonstrated, but others would argue that the hype on machine learning has already peaked and we're slowly shifting towards applications. So what's the role of control? So, I, you know, we, I'm waiting for the wave to crash, but it doesn't seem to crash. It seems to be building up. And so at this point, we should acknowledge probably machine learning has has come to stay, at least for a while. Now, what is there to be done? Um, I think there's still a big divide between methods that seem to work, but I don't have a theory, and of course the opposite. And so there's plenty of things to be done, of course, from our side in terms of certifying methods. On the other hand, once you go to real world, real time physical control systems, where we need to you know, provide real time computational guarantees, finite samples, safety, stability, and so on, I think there's still a lot of work to be done in making these methods practically useful so that you can actually implement them. So uh, it seems like uh, the two fields are actually attracting each other again. Yes, quite a lot. And I think that's also something that's different compared to other hype cycles where, you know, there were people going from control into systems biology or from control into smart grids or so. Here there's somewhat of a continuum between the machine learning world and the control world. There's, you know, joint conferences, journals, and so on and lots of people playing on both fields. Isn't PAD the earliest machine learning method? You could say so. You know, when Ziegler and Nichols in 1948 invented their essentially fully black box automated PAD tuning rules, you could think about that as a black box policy learning scheme. So yes, we've been done this for a whole while. It's not new. I want to shift gears now a little bit and maybe speak about a new topic. PAD control uh, represents 90% of controllers that are used in industry. Perhaps the last 9.999% is MPC. What is the purpose then of doing controlled research today? Well, if you want to be one of those people solving 99% of the problem, then you don't have to get a PhD in control, for sure. Um, but, you know, there's always problems left out there for which there's no pre-written MATLAB or Python code for you to press the button. We need somebody to think about it. We need somebody who knows system theory, who knows the power of abstractions, and can formulate a tractable mathematical representation of that problem and crack it eventually. Actually, Willems stated in one of his last papers the following quote, which I'm going to ask you to comment. Uh, Willem says, uh, from the beginning of my career until now, I have always been hearing that the field is dead, circuit theory is dead, information theory is dead, coding theory is dead, control theory is dead, system theory is dead, linear system theory is dead, and H-infinity is dead. Good science, however, is always alive. What do you think about this? First, I think he has a point. Control is a fairly mature field. I mean, we literally flew to the moon and back with LQR and Kalman filters, right? And that was in the 60s. So we should acknowledge that the core advances in core automatic control theory have been made. And they're saturating, right? On the other hand, the field is on the move, and there will always be challenges for us, such as in network system, what you mentioned before, in machine learning or in complicated applications. Yeah, as you say, control is nowadays a mature field, and perhaps I would like to step back a little bit here and look at the big picture. Suppose now that you could change everything in control. You could change the state of the art in control. 
what would you do? I don't know what the perfect scientific community looks like, but I know one community that handles research, dissemination and publications much better than we do, and that is economics. They don't bother with writing many small incremental conference papers. No, if you do a PhD in economics, you maybe finish your PhD with one, two, in exceptional cases even three, working papers, not even published ones. So they work on big problems. They go out, they present those problems, they get feedback, refine the paper, keep on iterating. And I think they really have that mindset going after the big problems, which we are lacking. Yeah, true. And also I, I feel that there is a tension between, you know, two types of mindsets in control. One is computational, the other one could be pen and paper style, if you prefer. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, originally, based on my training, I've been on the pen and paper side. I was having the perspective that unless you can solve a problem in close form with an explicit formula, then it's not considered scientific. Well, now I have a more moderate opinion, right? So computers are here. And computers will always win, if not today, then tomorrow. And so I think we should really embrace the computational aspect. And it's not like you cannot do any theory only because you use a computer to solve for you a complex problem as a subroutine. Yeah, and I guess this ties in very well with uh, another question that I had for you, and that's uh, where is the field of control heading to? I personally see three frontiers for our field, but these are only the ones that I see from my personal research. One is the intersection of computer science. So we've always had lots of joint problems and joint interests in topics like formal methods, distributed algorithms, call them consensus for instance, or machine learning problems more recently. And I think now the time is ripe for these two communities to join forces and work together. The other frontier I see is complicated networked systems. Think about infrastructure networks or pipelines of algorithms that are all, we've had many subsystems that are all interacting with another. And our community is ultimately the only one that really understands feedback and interaction and has a machinery on how to approach this complexity. Finally, I think applications will always provide demanding problems, problems for which there is no off-the-shelf solution and we just need somebody to sit down and think about it. And in this respect, I guess, an engineering mindset is always useful. I fully agree. Actually, I think that too many of our contributions are sort of building, you know, sand castles in the sky, if you want so, or um, house of cards in terms of their, they develop theory based on, you know, assumptions to make the theory work, but they, they never question the usefulness. And what I'm really after in my personal research is this creator of Nothing is more practical than a good theory, and I think that's what I'd like to develop. Um, I'd like to shift gears now a little bit and perhaps talk about a different topic. Uh, we're living in the age of tech giants. Amazon, Google, Facebook dominate markets, but are increasingly becoming present in uh, the research side as well. So what is the future of academic research? Well, first off, I think it's quite exciting that uh, companies or the R&D departments of companies are now working on cutting-edge research and not doing the bare minimum to keep their businesses running, right? Also offers beautiful landing spots for our PhD students and, as we all know, high salaries and free lunch. Um, so I really welcome that. Um, if you're working, say, in a more computational field like in uh, machine learning, then, of course, this is competition for you because they can outcompete you in terms of uh, financial or computational resources. But I don't think we have that problem in control. Yeah, that's also true. But um, let's get geeky now. After all, this sure. is also one of the aims of the podcast. And here I would like to surface the geeky side of control. So what's your favorite theorem in control theory or your favorite application? I have two of them. One is the, the infamous separation principle. Um, I teach that one in my bachelor lecture, like many of you out there. All right. And I just really enjoy teaching it because that's the point where frequency domain and state space come together, where you design a dynamic LTI compensator, where state feedback and observability come together. It's just that's where many of the strings connect. And so I really 
want to show this to the student and get them excited about, you know, that's the culmination of the bachelor lecture. Could you perhaps help the audience understand what is the separation principle for those who may not be familiar with uh, control theory? Sure. In its most basic version, the separation principle says that you can independently design a state feedback controller as well as a lunar bagger observer. And when you do the design separately, then they would separate in terms of the closed loop eigenvalues would be the union of the eigenvalues of the state feedback as well as the Lunberg observer. There are various extensions such as when you combine LQR and Kalman filtering, then optimality is preserved, for instance. Mm -hmm. What about the, the second theorem or application you had in mind? The second one is the infamous uh, gersh gorin circle theorem. Ah. It states the following. It says the eigenvalues of a matrix can be localized in a bunch of circles each of which is centered at the diagonal element of the matrix and has as a radius the sum of the absolute values of the off-diagonal elements. So the theorem is very simple to state. It's actually also very simple to prove, but it has quite profound application. In fact, much of algebraic graph theory, consensus, and Markov chain rely on that theorem. I guess there are many goals that a researcher at your stage may want to achieve. You know, you may want to focus on research, you may want to focus on education or, you know, other managerial activities. I guess it would be curious to know uh, what would you like to achieve? It is quite a multitasking job, isn't it? What, I, what I'm really after these days is the following. I, I don't care so much about yet another paper, an award, citations or so. But I, I feel I have a duty to educate the next bright generation of the tech leaders. And, and that's what I want to achieve. When I teach bachelors or when I interact with PhD students, I think that's my mission these days. Well, speaking of which, uh, positive role models certainly have an influence on how we grow up, not just academically, but also in general as people. And, and so in this respect, I would like to ask you, what are the most influential figures? Who are the most influential figures for you, if you had to choose three? So it's hard to shine a spotlight on only three people, because whenever you call on three, that means you miss on many others. Um, so let me start off with a politically correct answer and shine the spotlight, not on the contemporary person, but on Bruce Francis, my diploma thesis advisor. He just had a, a beautiful mind, quoting the famous movie, um, he taught me so much. He was a role model in each and every aspect. And that's what I want to what, live up for. You know, these are the standards. If I had to call it a contemporary person, then I would pick somebody whose papers have always impressed me. You know, when you read a paper and you say, think about, this is so deep, this is so impressive. I wish I had written that paper. So there's one person who had this sensation multiple times, actually. And that's... David Anschley from Imperial College. Ah, that's quite interesting. Yes, he just invented so many concepts that are you know, not just cutting edge technical and also practically useful, but that really are used in my day-to-day -day research, such as um, almost global stability, input state stability and manifolds, monotone systems, you name it. He has done so many things. And yeah, he's one of my rock stars for sure out there. <laughs> that's quite interesting. And what about the third one? As a third one, I'd like to mention a person whom I had the pleasure to interact with about two weeks ago. Um, you wouldn't call him control if you're inside the control community necessarily, but I guess to the outside world, everybody would call him an automation engineer, maybe the automation engineer. Um, it's Alberto San Giovanni Vicentelli. You know, in, in my business, you get to meet a lot of very bright people out there. But every once in a while, you get to meet somebody who's just on another level which is so sharp, so much quick and picking up things. And it was really impressive just to have a conversation with him. You said that you're interested in social networks. And so why sociology? Where is the role of control there? So why sociology? I think these are fascinating questions that, unlike others that we study, I can discuss them with a mother, even with my grandmother. She will have an opinion on that. So it's just really fun to work on problems that everybody cares about on the street. Now, where can we make a contribution? Well, unlike 50 years ago, nowadays sociology is not about writing books and setting up hypotheses and providing lots of philosophy to support them, but rather it's computational. Now there's a lot of data available 
you have the chance to model people's behavior and validate those models and even make bold predictions. So this changes the game and that's of course what we are strong at and our methods such as let it be game theory, um, time series identification and so on. I guess there's an interesting follow-up here. In control theory, we don't just care about predicting, but we also care about controlling. You know, if, if you're honest, we're already beyond that stage. Somebody who understood opinion dynamics, so for instance, the GRU models sufficiently well, was able to allegedly manipulate the American elections by manipulating the opinion exchange on social network platforms. <laughs> so <laughs> and this is not futuristic, this has <laughs> happened. They were aware of definitely quantitative methods on how to model the evolution of the opinions in social networks, but also how to manipulate them. I guess an interesting question is how do we contrast that? So how do we make a better society if we know that these appraisal models can be manipulated from outside? Well, define better. It's hard to define the cost function for society. That's a discussion I personally shouldn't get into here in this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it would be a bit too controversial. Well, we have covered a lot of ground today. I guess my last question uh, relates to the future of new students in the field. So if you were a student today, what would you invest on? What would you do? Well, that's a question that I actually get to work on on almost a daily basis when I onboard new students. And so what I find important is that you need to work on problems that matter in the long run. Don't have a prediction horizon of just the next two papers, but think about deep problems, problems that have a profound impact even five years from now. And those problems are not lying on the street, so you need to take your time to find them. And so what I do with my own students, I tell them, listen, don't publish anything for the first two years, maybe three years. Let's just go on a random walk. Let's define a set of keywords and then get lost inside the simplex of keywords, brainstorm, discover many things until we have found the killer problem. And I feel, I feel more people should get lost than go on that random walk and, you know, prefer exploration over exploitation. So when you were a student, what was the first thing you got in your hand then? So my first day at UC Santa Barbara, my advisor, Francesco Bullo, handed me a paper. Not necessarily a technical paper, but it was a short essay by Richard Hemming entitled Stroke of Genius, which was all about the right reasons why you should do research. What research problem should you work on? And it's truly an inspiring essay. I recommend it to all of you. And actually hand this one also to my own students these days. I'd like to close with a quote by Richard Hamming. If you are to do important work, then you must work on the right problem, at the right time and in the right way. Without any of the three, you may do good work, but you will almost certainly miss the real greatness. Thank you for listening. I hope you liked the show today. If you enjoyed the podcast, please consider giving us five stars on Apple Podcasts, follow us on Spotify, support on Patreon or PayPal, and connect with us on social media platforms. See you next time.